All right, this is Dr. Morton. This is the lecture uh, for logic design number five for Wednesday, September 2nd. Okay, we're going to pick up where we left off last week. Let me first just uh, touch on the syllabus. I'm going to shrink this down here briefly, and then we'll, we'll look at the syllabus. So we have here... Uh, let me, I'll move it over here a little bit. So we have here... Uh, the week and this is September 2nd continue to uh, review unit 2 uh, you can look at the PowerPoint slides number 2 on blackboard and uh, you can um, I think I'm I, I may put up a little video on uh, on uh, truth tables um, but anyway uh, I guess really I think that should be yeah, I think this should be, I don't know why I said video 4, it should be video 5. Uh, and then I lost track. Yeah, I lost track. I guess I slipped a gl glitch here on counting. So that should be 5 and this should be 6. Everything's going to be off by 1, shucks. So I'll have to go fix that. Uh, remember, um, so uh, homework 1 was due uh, on Monday. Homework 2 uh, is going to be due on September 4th, which is Friday. So it's a kind of a quick turnaround. Uh, I will save some time at the end, and I will go over some of the homework two questions, or at least talk about them a little bit. Okay, so moving on. Um, let me uh, bring up the slides, and here they are. And then I'm going to see if I can find this. Yeah, we'll slide this down over here, and good. Okay, and then I think I'm going to just see if I can do this. Uh, no. No, that's a go. Yeah, okay, that's not too bad. All right. Something like that. Okay. So, Boolean algebra. So, in Boolean algebra, we form expressions. And our expressions, are cons uh, they consist of variables, constants, and operators. I haven't introduced all the operators to you, but, but we have uh, somewhat talked about the AND gate, the OR gate, and the NOT or the inverter. Um, constants are just 0 and 1, and we don't use those very much really, uh, but we do, use, uh, we do use variables, and typically our variables are A, B, C, D, or W, X, Y, Z. Uh, we may use other variables from time to time. Our up, our our functions are often called f, and sometimes if we have more than one, we'll put on subscripts like f0, f1, f2, or maybe f1, f2, f3, or whatever. Uh, we can have complicated expressions just by uh, adding additional uh, terms to the expression. We do have an order of precedence, and that is uh, the nots are evaluated first, then our ands, and then our ors. Um, and uh, you do have to use parentheses when you do inversions because you invert the operators and it changes the order of precedence. And so you have to be careful with parentheses. And we'll talk about that when we get to it. Uh, the nice thing, or the, the powerful thing, and the reason this is something we use a lot, is because every single one of these expressions corresponds to hardware directly. Uh, all right. So... So our, our information content in, in a given variable depends on uh, how many distinct states that variable can take on. And uh, if a variable can take on uh, two different states, then, then, that, uh, then that allows us to represent two different uh, uh, pieces of information. And if it can take on, uh, if it's two bits worth, then it can take on four distinct states. If it's n bits, it can take on two to the n distinct states. So with eight bits, we can get uh, 256 different things, starting with zero to 255. And um, and that that that's a pretty good measure of the information. We can also do the go the opposite way, but we have to use the base two logarithms, which are a little bit you know a little bit tricky to to dig up. Uh, but you don't really have to use them, you, all you really have to do is just know the powers of 2. And 
we'll go over that. But the powers of two are really easy to, to memorize. Uh, anyway, if you have, let's say you have s distinct states. So if you take the log base two of s and you round up to the nearest integer, that tells you how many bits you have to have to represent s distinct different things or states. Um, so let's see. Uh, let's do an example of that, I guess. Um, so I'm going to, let me switch to the, uh, I'm going to make this bigger and I will switch to the thing here. I did, by the way, increase my resolution, so hopefully it's be, be a little more legible. We'll see. Okay, and then I'm going to slide this back. Okay. Good. All right. So if we do, um, let's say we want to, let's say we want to represent uh, numbers to indicate every student in our class. And let's say we have, uh, let's say we have uh, 95 students. I don't know how many we have, but that's probably not a bad guess. And let me see if I can get this. That's a little bit better. Anyway, I don't know. This doesn't. This has a terrible focusing problem. All right. So let's say we have 95 students in the class. How many? How if we wanted to set up a uh, a memory location? How many bits would that location have to have in it? To be able to keep uh, to, to assign a unique number to 95 different students that would fit in however many bits. Well, this is where we do. Uh, wh this is where we do the the, uh, the log base two. And uh, if I set this up, let's see. I think that's two. Okay, so I'll put in 95. And it turns out that the log log base two base 2 of 95 equals 6.6.57 6 we round up so that gives us 7 bits now if we do 2 to the 7th what we should find is that uh, that should be 128 and uh, so we could have known that because we can just memorize the powers of 2 and basically uh, 1 bit is is two to the first or two two bits is four things three bits is eight four is sixteen thirty two sixty four one twenty eight and two fifty six this is what a byte can do two fifty six and uh and then nine is five twelve and one k is ten twenty four one k is one k is ten twenty four now here's what's really kind of cool. Let's see, I'll use a little piece left. So 1k is 1024. Uh, 1 meg, so one, and that's 10 bits. Okay, let me start with a blank sheet. So 1 1k is 10 bits. 1 meg is 20. One, um, one, uh, so one gigabyte is 30. One uh, terabyte is 40. One petabyte is 50. And one exabyte is 60 bits. So 10 bits for a K, 20 for a meg, 30 for a gig, 40 for a terabyte, 50 for a petabyte, 60 for an exabyte. So if I told you that we wanted to uh, keep track of 4 billion things, so that's 4 gigabytes. So you already know you need, you need, for a gigabyte you need 30 bits, and for 4 gigabytes you need 2 more bits, so that's 32. Because remember, uh, 1 bit equals 2. So 2 gigabytes would be 31. Uh, 2 bits is 4. 3 bits is 8. We just went through this. 4 is 16. 
5 is 32, 6 is 64, 7 is 128, 8 is 256, and 9 is uh, 512. And 10, we're back to, we're up to the next uh, um, order of magnitude. Actually, three orders of magnitude. Okay? So, uh, so all you do, all you have to do is remember 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512. And that 1K is 10, 1 meg is 20, 1 gig is 30, 1 terabyte is 40, 1 petabyte is 50, and 1 exabyte is 60. And now, right off the top of your head, you can tell me exactly how many bits you need for any value up to uh, uh, a thousand trillion, whatever that is, an exabyte, 60 bits. So that's a pretty big number, probably don't need to go there. Uh, so let's say, let's, let's say you need to, uh, you want to represent um, 80,000 uh, 80, things. So what do you need that's going to do that? Well, for 80,000, so that's, that's, that's basically roughly 80K, not exactly because it's a power of two, so it's a little more than this, but it usually rounds out that that's uh, just about what you need. So if we do go for 80K, um, so 80K, 80K is going to be somewhere between 64 and 128K. So it, to get there, we're going to need 7 bits plus a K, or we're going to need 17 bits. Because 10 bits for a K and 7 for 128. So we will be able to represent 128,000 things instead of 80,000. But if you went with 6 bits, you'd only be able to represent 64,000. So it, it would be a little short. So to get the 80, you're going to have to go all the way up to 128. Easy. And so right off the top of your head, you know that's 17 bits. All right, so you should just remember all this. It's pretty straightforward. Okay, and that gives you, that tells you a lot about the information content. Okay, let me switch the camera, and we will press on with the march here. Okay, yes. Uh, oh, okay. Okay, so, all right, so hopefully then you see how we can use the base two logarithm, and you can, you don't really have the, you don't really have to use it because you can basically memorize all the powers of two all the way up to, you know, almost 70 bits if you want. So, uh, so it's a, actually, that's very powerful. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so for example, how many do, how many bits does it take to represent angles every two degrees from zero to 110? Now, here's one thing that's a little tricky. You need to remember that you have to count zero because you have to be able to represent zero because it's one of the possibilities. So, so if you do the division, you take 110 and you divide it by two. That's 55, and then you have to add one. For zero because that's 56. So you take the log base 2 of 56, it's 5.8, and you round to 6 bits. But you could have known that because you're already thinking, well, um, so 1 bit is 2, 2 bits is 4, 3 bits is 8, 4 bits is 16, 5 is 32, 6 is 64, and uh, 64 is enough to cover 56 different things. So that's all you had to all you had to do. All right. Um, let's see what else. I think uh, so. Basic logic operations. We're going to talk about the three basic logic blocks now. We've already hinted at these and talked about them somewhat, but inversion or complementation. Uh, anding and oring, and you can you can implement any logic with these. Any any logic expression can be represented by a two-layer net using these three logic blocks. 
inversion. We represent it with this little triangle and, and we have a bubble. The bubble can be filled in or it can be hollow and the bubble can be on either side. It can be on the input or it can be on the output. The flat edge, the point is pointing to the output. So generally speaking, here you put in x and you get out x prime, which means you get the inverse of x. If x is 1, you get out 0. If x is 0, you get out 1. If x, of course, 0 meaning false. If x is false, you get out true. If x is true, you get out false. And we usually represent the logic 1 with a higher voltage and a lo logic 0 with a lower voltage. Sometimes we'll call this the not. Okay, so that's inversion. And. And is one of the fundamental basic functions. And we'll talk about this a little bit. Um, but there are... Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about this in just a minute, maybe. Uh, I'll do this. Okay, so if we take the AND gate, uh, this is a two-input AND gate. Now, the inverter only has one input and one output. But the AND gate can have some really any number of inputs, there is a practical, realizable limit to how many inputs you can have. Like you couldn't have 400, that would be a little crazy. Uh, to do that, you would have, it would be a very complicated circuit. And most of the time, we'd, we would implement that uh, just using multiple AND gates and ANDing the, uh, the, the outputs of those together in sort of a cascaded way. But, but in theory, you could have any number of inputs you want. This, this is for two inputs. But the logic is pretty straightforward. For any number of inputs, it sort of looks the same. All right. And, and an AND gate with that many inputs would be very impractical, actually. It, it's hard to imagine an application for that. OK. So we do remember we represent ANDing with the multiplication sign. Normally, we don't write it. We just imply it. But then with constants, you kind of have to write it. So 0 times 0 equals 0. 0 times 1 equals 0. 1 times 0 equals 0, but 1 times 1 equals 1. Now this is this is algebraically correct, so that makes it easier to remember. The, but a lot of times we do misunderstand the concept of AND. Um, but in, in the way we will use it in this course and the way it is understood throughout the whole discipline of logic design is that you're, you're, you must A and B mo must both be true for F to be true. And if you have ABC, ABC must all be true for F to be true. And if any one of those is false, F would be false, even if the others are true. This is not how it's always used. For instance, sometimes if you do a internet search and you type in, uh, you know, parenting and two-year-olds, you'll get all the articles that mention parenting, you'll get all the articles that mention two-year-olds, and some of those articles will mention parenting and two-year-olds, but your your retrieval would not in, typically be strictly limited to articles about parenting and two-year-olds. So, uh, but that's really what the formal definition of and means. So, um, this is very powerful, and we'll we'll talk about this later. But again, with just and and or and inversion, we can represent in two layers any logic expression that exists. All right, so now we have, uh, this This is a truth table. We have all possibilities of our two input variables and we list the resultant output for every combination of inputs. So zero, zero, and it's actually every permutation of inputs really if you will. Zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. And that gives us F is false, 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 true. So if they're both true, we get out true. Now, or is the opposite. It is, it's considered the inverse of and, but it isn't really the inverse. It's kind of weird. Because if you took the strict inverse of and, uh, what, what happened to my thing? Here it is. Okay, there we go. We'll bring this back. Okay. If you, took, if you take the strict, there's or, and there's and. So the strict inverse of and would be a NAND gate. And a NAND gate is 1, 1, 1, 0, whereas an OR, an or gate is 0, 1, 1, 1. So it's not, it's not strictly speaking the inverse. But we use it when we invert an expression with an AND in it, we change all the ANDs to ORs. So 
it's it does work out to be sort of the inverse. So that's kind of an um, interesting thing. Anyway, in the case of the OR gate, if any input is a 1, the output's a 1. And if they're both 1, the output's a 1. Only time f is 0 is when they're both 0, as you can see in the truth table. Same, same kind of table, but here our f represents a different function. This is the R function. Now one of the questions that could pop up is how many different uh, truth tables with two inputs and one output could you construct? And that's actually an interesting question, right? And if you think about it, because you get four different representations for f, one for when a and b are 0, one when it's 0, 1, when it's 1, 0, and one when it's 1, 1, so there are four rows. So there's four possible bits here. So that really turns out to be 16 different uh, two input gates. And if we make a chart of, of those entire 16 gates, uh, which you should do, you should sit down and convince yourself of this, um, you will find that that the uh, that it that it represents all of our all of the functional gates we talk about in uh, in logic design. And so of course the AND gate and the OR gate would be represented. Uh, and then the NAND gate and the NOR gate also come out. The exclusive OR and the exclusive NOR come out. And then and then uh, and there are a few others well there so then there's uh, the, where f is always 0 and and that's just the constant 0 or false and where f is always 1 that's where f is guaranteed to be true no matter the inputs so those are not so particularly useful uh, and by the time we get through with all of them really they're, they're the only significant gates are the and the or the nan the nor and the exclusive or and the exclusive nor and everything else is uh, just kind of uh, related directly to those gates. Uh, in a couple of them don't depend on B, a couple of them don't depend on A. And so they kind of work out to be the inverse basically. Um, okay, so anyway, uh, so they're kind of not particularly useful. So those are the three most basic gates and then later on we'll talk about the NAND gate, the NOR gate, the exclusive OR gate, and the exclusive NOR gate or the equivalence gate. Um, okay, I'm going to, uh, so now we're going to talk about truth tables. Now truth tables are uh, super fundamental to logic design. Truth tables are our source document for doing combinational design. When we get to the last part of the course, sequential design, we will use a different type of uh, source document called a state table. So a state table is the sequential design what a truth table is to combinational design. But for now, we're just going to talk about truth tables. And then when we start with the uh, second portion, then we will definitely uh, we'll definitely cover then uh, the truth table in a little more depth. But we're going to we're going to kind of dig into it now. But then we're going to we're going to show uh, we're we'll going to a lot more in the second part of the course. All right. So. Um, what a truth table does, it has some number of independent variables, or you can call it, you can think of them as your input variables. And it, then it has at least one output variable, which is a de dependent variable. It could have more than one. For every additional input variable or independent variable, you double the number of rows in the truth table. For every additional output variable, you increase the number of columns by one. But the truth table can get quite large if you have a lot of input variables. So uh, usually we try and avoid getting truth tables that are that big. We try and break our problem down to smaller pieces if we can. Okay, and what the truth table does, it tells you for every possible combination of, of the inputs what the desired output is for the single output variable if you just have one or for each output variable if you have multiple. Now, when we, and when we do our design, we're going to basically take what the customer is asking for and turn it into a truth table. And so what it really represents then is our customer's desire, our customer's 
demands, if you were, a customer's order. And because of this, uh, I, well, because students often ask, how do we get the truth table? And, and that, for most of our problems, it's kind of, it's, it can be a little confusing because it, sometimes it just pops up and you want to know, how do we get that? Well, it was given to us, okay? It comes from whatever the representative customer was. And for, for when we're using a textbook and we're teaching the course, uh, we don't really have a customer. So you can think of this as coming, kind of coming from God. At least that's, that's how I describe it, mostly to get it to stick into your brain. So the truth table comes from God, okay, your customer. And, of course, if you're really going to, uh, to be a successful business person, normally you think of your customer as God and you try and keep them happy. You try and uh, you try and you know whatever they say, that's what you're going to do. But of course, there's a, an underlying assumption that they're going to pay for it. Um, so that's kind of interesting. All right. So we considered our gold standard, and we also go back to it and verify that what we built satisfies the truth table. And if it does, then we we did a good job. And if it doesn't, we made a mistake. Okay. So anyway. Every appearance of a variable or a complement in an expression is called a literal. So all of our logic expressions are made up of literals or variables, and then appearance of those variables called literals, and then operators. So, uh, okay, and uh, so remember, if you it everything, all of our independent variables are only allowed to be either ones or zeros. And so for n variables, that gives us 2 to the n rows. Um, sometimes we'll add some additional columns and even break our, our uh, uh, we'll have, uh, if we have a complicated expression that we're representing, we might even, uh, we might even uh, break it down into, into sub-expressions and use a different column for those when we're trying to prove that uh, a logic expression uh, is true and we often can prove it by showing from a truth table that for all possible values of the variables that the two sides are equal and we can use a truth table to do that all right so let's talk about this so how many variables and literals are in the following expression and how many terms so first off if you look at it how many variables well you have a variable a you have a variable b and a variable c so the three variables how many literals Okay, remember, a literal is every appearance of a variable. So A appears here and here and here and here. Here it's inverted, there it's inverted, here it's not. B appears in every one of these, inverted, not inverted, not inverted, inverted. And so does, uh, and C appears in all but one, not inverted, inverted, and inverted. So if you count them up, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten appearances of our variables are ten literals. How many terms? Okay, so this is kind of interesting. So first off, what do we have represented by our plus signs? The plus function we, we, equivalent, we, we equate to the or function, right? And then notice we have implied multiplication here. We didn't use the sign. So this is A multiplied by B prime multiplied by C. But of course, we're not really talking about multiplication. We're really talking about anding. So this represents an AND gate with A, B prime, and C going into it. And the primes represent our inversions. So if you really wanted to be picky, you'd say this is B going into an inverter and the output of the inverter going into the AND gate along with A and C. Here A goes through the inverter and then into the gate and B just goes in. Here A and C get inverted and B doesn't. And here B and C both are inverted going into the AND gate. And so this gives us... Uh, a one AND term, another AND term, another AND term, and a fourth AND term. So that's three ter that's four terms. But then what about these plus signs? The whole expression is one big OR gate with four inputs. The output of this AND gate going into the OR gate, the output of this AND gate going into the OR gate, the output of this AND gate and this AND gate also going into that four input OR gate. Which, which I like to talk about, we have a set of input gates, one, two, three, four AND gates going in, uh, and we have one output gate, the OR gate, because all two layer nets work out to follow that pattern. A number of input gates that go into typically one output gate. Now sometimes, because we 
don't have gates with enough inputs, we might have to, to uh, add a layer and, uh, and do uh, an intermediate layer where we put half the gates into one OR gate and half to the other, and those two OR gates into a final output OR gate. We might have to do that with input AND gates, too. And sometimes that does increase the number of layers. Now, so three variables, ten literals, and four terms. Now, you could also argue that the final output OR gate is another term, but normally that we just we we basically have covered that by calling that the, ex, the 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 entire expression. So anyway, that's a little confusing, but we'll say four terms, one expression, three variables, ten literals. All right, and uh, if we have the expression a b prime plus c, we can draw the gate structure that actually represents this exact logic expression. Here it is. B going in through an inverter into this AND gate, which uh, in the in chapter two we're going to use a dot in our AND gate and a plus in our OR gates just to remind you about the terminology, but we're going to abandon that later on. Uh, and normally you don't draw them with dot with a dot. You don't draw the AND gate with a dot. You don't draw the OR gate with a plus. Out of this AND gate comes the term AB prime. That's the first term right here. And then notice we have a C term. That C term doesn't go through an AND gate because it's just all by itself. You can think of it as a degenerative AND gate because we could have a two input AND gate, tie them together and put C in, and then C would come out, and uh, then it would go into this OR gate. But we're just gonna write C here instead. And now our final output OR gate, ORs, AB prime and C together like this. So that's our final expression. So this inverter, this AND gate, and this OR gate completely implement this expression, AB prime plus C. And it is a two-layer net, if you don't count this inversion layer, which we don't normally count. And the reason we don't normally count it, and you'll see this when we get to flip-flops, most of our registers and flip-flops have a B and a B prime, an A and an A prime, a C and a C prime output. So we don't usually have to go out and get an inverter to get the B prime. It's usually available somewhere in our logic. Okay. Um, all right. And then uh, if we change our order of precedence here by having A multiplied by B prime plus C by putting parentheses, it changes the logic. There's our old expression, and here's our new one. Notice that they're not the same, and they don't give you the same output either. Okay, we're gonna, uh, I think what I'm gonna do, we'll go through the basic theorems. I think I may give you a little bit shorter video tonight, and um, rather than go through the, the basic theorems, I'm just gonna cover the first uh, few theorems here that are really simple, and then I'll switch out of that, and, uh, and I will, uh, and we'll finish, uh, we'll finish up on Friday, the rest of the theorems. And I, I, what I might do instead is I hope a, a hold a Zoom session on Thursday where you can come ask your questions about the homework due Friday. I think I'll set it up like that instead of going over it uh, in the, this lecture, even though I promised that at the beginning. Okay, so let's just do that. So we're first going to do uh, operations with uh, 0 and 1. And uh, so if we or x with 0, we just get x. If we or x with 1, then it's always true. If we and x with 1, we just get x. But if we and x with 0, it's always false. And again, these are always just the dual of this side. And we'll talk about the dual in a little bit. Then if we or x with itself, we get x. If we and x with itself, we get x. And you can check these out by letting x equal 0 and letting x equal 1 and make sure both sides are always equal. Okay, if we inverse, if we take the inverse of the inverse, we just get back to the original. And if we multiply x by its inverse, or sorry, if we or x with its inverse, we always get 1. If we and x with its inverse, we always get 0. Anding x and y in this order versus that order makes no difference. Same with oring x and y, it makes no difference. So it's, it's, they're, they, they're, they obey the laws of commutation and they obey the laws of association. If we have x, y, and z, 
we can first and x and y and then and the result of that was z and it's the same as x anded with y and z anded together and it's the same as x y and z going into a three input and gate now let me just say that this is definitely true of and gates and or gates uh, and I guess I should have done it with OR gates over here, but this is not true of NAND gates and NOR gates. All right, the first distributive law, this is you can take X and distribute it against Y and Z, and you get XY plus XZ. This is just normal algebra, totally legal and normal algebra. You, you also know here you can factor the X out and you get X times Y plus Z. All right, but uh, here is the second distributive law, which is not something you, is legal in, in normal algebra. It's totally illegal, but you can do it in switching algebra, and it really helps us a lot. And this is called the second distributive law. X plus YZ equals X plus Y quantity times X plus Z quantity. Now, let me just say that uh, sometimes students will want to factor the X out of this and get X times uh, Y plus Z. And that's just completely wrong. That's, I, that's terrible. That doesn't uh, work at all. But you can do x plus yz. That is correct because of the second distributive law. All right. And then I'm, I'll cover these three simplification theorems, and then we're going to quit. So the first simplification theorem is xy plus xy prime equals x. x plus xy equals x. x plus y prime times y equals xy. Now the reason for that, if you multiply, distribute y in here, you get xy plus y prime y. Well, we know y prime y is always zero, so that goes away, so you just get xy. Uh, here, th the, the y doesn't add anything, because uh, if x is zero, you, you will get a zero out of this, regardless of the value of y, because zero and with y will always be zero, no matter what y is. And, uh, and if x is one, this term doesn't isn't meaningful because you already have a one here, so this won't add anything. So, uh, so that basically proves that. And these are just the duals. And then this one, uh, this we combine terms here, so we have an x y and an x y prime. This this basically is the same as x. And it's a little confusing, but regardless of y, if y is zero, then this term will go to zero, but this term. The y, the y prime will be 1, so it's just x. And if y is 1, then this term goes to 0, and this term would just be x times 1, or and with 1, which is just x. So that's why this, these, you can combine these. And obviously, you could have wxy and wxy prime, and you could combine them to wx. Uh, all right, I'm going to quit with that, and um, then we will, we will pick up... Uh, uh, on Friday with uh, the rest of this chapter and I'll, I will uh, do a live Zoom session on Thursday where I'll help you with the homework. I do think the, uh, the TA should be kicking in this week and doing some live Zoom evening sessions too, so hopefully that'll all work. I'll do mine during the day on Thursday. All right, we will uh, see you later.